a special service to me. I've always enjoyed uh, doing our candlelight Christmas communion. And uh, this year as we were looking at, uh, when I ran across the Why the Nativity uh, sermon series and the opportunity to have the movie, this last one in, this, in his series, as I looked at it, it just fits so perfectly with this particular service. And it's called Why Call Him Savior. And I kind of took it in not only why we call him Savior, but why we need a Savior. And the first thing is as we see him being called Savior, I like to look at what is in the meaning of a name. And most of us, I'm sure at some point, have, have uh, researched or at least looked at what our names mean. William, or Bill, is, is a protector. And... Um, we didn't know till years later that we named our daughter Woman of Sorrow, I believe it was, or something. Unfortunate. Unfortunate one. Yeah, we didn't know that. We didn't research that one before we named her. But uh, most people, and, and all through the Scripture, uh, God had reasons for naming different things and why different people were named different things throughout Scripture. And we know that as... As uh, God foretold and as he talked to Joseph, he gave Joseph two different things to call Jesus. And one scripture he tells him his name will be called Jesus. And one he tells him his name will be called Emmanuel. Now, when you look at the meaning, Emmanuel is God with us. It describes where he is going to be. But the word Jesus, and also the, the name Jesus, and also the name Joshua, they, have the, they are both derived from the Hebrew word, for the Lord is salvation. So Jesus, in, in his name of Jesus and Emmanuel, tells us that he is our salvation and he is with us. It tells us, it describes him and what his purpose is, but it also describes his proximity or where he's going to be when he fulfills that purpose. And as I look at that and I think about that name, Jesus, that he is our salvation, but he came to be with us. Now throughout Scripture... <clears throat> we see him called things such as the Lamb of God, the Man of Sorrows, the Prince of Peace, the Good Shepherd, the Mighty God, the Bright and Morning Star, Emmanuel, Daybreak or Dayspring, the Rock, the Judge, the Bread of Life, King of Kings. He's called Teacher. He's called the Light of the World. He's called the Servant. And he's also called the Only Way to Heaven. As a matter of fact, over 300 different names and titles are given to him throughout Scripture. But tonight we're going to focus on one, and that is Savior. Why he is called our Savior. Charles Hadley Spurgeon is one of my favorite pastors to, to listen to or look at back at his sermons. And he is called the Prince of Preachers. On one occasion, he was trying to, as you look at these 300 different names of Jesus, we can't even in those, we cannot contain what he means to us or what he really means. And, and, and Spurgeon said it this way. He said, as he tried to describe the character surrounding the character or the, 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 who Jesus is, he says, I know my words cannot honor him according to his merit. I wish they could. Indeed, I grow less and less satisfied with my thoughts and language concerning him. He is too glorious for my feeble language to describe him. If I could speak with tongues of men and of angels, I could not speak worthily of him. If I could borrow all the harmonies of heaven and enlist every harp and the songs of of the glorified were not that music sweet enough for his praises. You see, we can't even fathom. Our, our minds, our language, our, all that we behold cannot contain or cannot 
describe what Jesus is to all of us and what Jesus means to the world. Now, when we think of Savior, back in Luke chapter 2, and of course we, throughout the Christmas season, we read a lot out of Luke, we read a lot out of Matthew. But in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, it says, as the angel is talking to the shepherds, it says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The angels, when they first proclaimed Jesus on earth, when they first told the, the shepherds what they were getting ready to go and worship, as the angel described where they, would, where they would find Jesus, and they described where he was and how he was going to be wrapped in all this, they describe him, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Even as a baby. And we know that the act of salvation came with his dying on the cross. But He was our Savior before He even started. He was our Savior from the beginning. See, we have a promise of a Savior. That's the first thing that we see. We had the promise of the Savior who is proclaimed here among the shepherds or to the shepherds, but even before that, many, many years ago, 700 years before He came, we see Isaiah tell, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You see, he was foretold that he was coming. And he came with a purpose. And he came for the purpose of bringing us salvation. You see, we can't save ourselves. We cannot earn our way. We cannot work our way. We cannot be good enough. We can't pay our way. You see, we had to be saved. We have to, we have to be saved from ourselves. Sin came into the world with Adam and Eve, and sin has always been a part of the world, and sin is a part of everybody's life. And you can't fix it. That's just hard for us to, for, for man today to understand. And I think we, we see a lot of times it's, it's women who, who accept Christ a little easier sometimes than men do. And I think that's the, one of the reasons is that's because we're fixers. We think that we should be able to fix everything. We think, you know, whatever's broke, I need to fix it. Something tears up, I need to fix it. Somebody's hurting, I need to fix it. When our daughter was in, was in preschool, we went to a um, we went to a parent teacher conference, and uh, we sat down there with the with the teacher, and she looked at me. She said, "What what do you do?" And I said, "Well, I'm a contractor. I'm I'm an electrician, mechanical contractor, and I also do all all kinds sorts of other works, build some houses." And she said, "That explains it." She said, "Everything that tears up in our classroom, your daughter says, my daddy could fix that." <laughs> But when it comes to our sin, when it comes to our messed up lives, I can't fix that. I can't correct it. I can't do enough. I can't work enough. I can't sing enough. I can't pay enough. I needed a Savior. And we see here that, that this Savior was promised to us, not just in Isaiah, He was promised all the way back at the beginning of time. He was, he was promised to us when, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden. And He told the serpent, He told Satan, He will bruise your head. You'll bruise His heel, but He'll crush your head. You see, we've, we needed a Savior then. Adam and Eve needed that Savior. And he was, pro he was proclaimed, He was promised from the beginning of time. 
And here we see that, that at this Christmas season, we don't, we're, not, we're not shown this baby in the manger. We talk about the baby in the manger, but here the, 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 the angels didn't just proclaim a newborn baby. They proclaimed a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. We also see the purpose of the Savior. This Savior who, is came, for, who came for us, about 30 years later, he's walking along. And as he's walking along, he encounters this strange little man who's climbed up in a tree. We used to sing about him. A man by the name of Zacchaeus. He was wealthy. He was a tax collector. Most people didn't like him. But when Jesus passed his way, he looked up at Zacchaeus and said, Come down for today, I'm going to dine with thee. The people of the town, the religious leaders, they didn't like it. They didn't like the fact that Jesus would go and meet with the tax collector. They didn't like the fact that Jesus would go and eat with the tax collector, would socialize with the tax collector. A man of such stature, a man, of, a man who, was, who, who, who was hated so much by the people, who was known to cheat people. Most of us would look at Zacchaeus and say, well, I'm better off than he was, but you're still not good enough. As they, were, as they were confronting Jesus about this in Luke chapter 19. In verse 10, Jesus says to them, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. First thing we see that a Savior, that the uh, purpose of this Savior is, is to seek. You know, the, the, the thing is, I wasn't looking for Jesus. There's not a sinner today that said they sought to get saved. You know, a lot of, a lot of churches and a lot of preachers, they have this idea that, that if I stand here and I preach and I stand here and I, and, I, and I share the gospel, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Let me tell you something. The lost people of this world are not seeking out God. The lost people of this world are not seeking out a Savior. The lost people of this world, they don't have a desire to be in here in the church. If they did, they would be here. They didn't have a desire to go to Jesus. You see, because we, there again, we can't, we can't make that decision for ourselves. We have to be drawn. And Jesus said, I have come to seek you see, we have to be sought out by Him. We have to be drawn by Him. We are told, we're told in the, in the Scripture about the lost lamb. We're told in the Scripture about the lost coin. That lost lamb that has is, that is run out, that has got away from the other 99. You know what? It just keeps going. It just keeps getting more and more and more lost. It's the shepherd who goes to find the lamb. It was the woman who lost the coin. The coin didn't just keep rolling and rolling and rolling trying to find its way back to that woman. No, she had to seek for the lost coin. Jesus said, I have come to seek out the lost. And he found him with Zacchaeus, but he also found it with me and with many of you. You see, we needed a Savior to not just to save us, but to find us, to seek us out. But then we needed Him to save us. So the, the first thing we see here is, the, is, is that he, he sought us, but then we see that He saves us. Now when we think of somebody being saved, when we think of, of somebody being saved, we, 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 I, you think back in your mind of, of movies like uh, The Guardian where the, the, the people are, are going down on the ship and the, the rescue swimmer goes and, and tries to dig them out or, or, or one of the movies where, where people are trapped in a mine and they try to dig them out and they try to get, get oxygen down to them. And, and we think of things like that. We think of, of, of hurricanes when we think of people being saved. But you know, those are all 
Those are all temporal. Those are all temporary situations. See, being saved just from one event is not what we need. I remember one time when I was a kid, and this wasn't long after I got saved. I, I, I didn't know... I didn't understand all the questions to ask, and I didn't. I, I was six years old, but I do remember one time, and I might have been seven by this point, And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really have a real firm grasp on salvation, other than the fact that Jesus had saved me. And I was asking people, "Have you been saved?" That's all I knew to ask. Have you been saved? And I remember one of my friends telling me, yeah, one time I, 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 I fell off my bike and my dad grabbed me before I hit the ground. And that was what he thought of when, he asked, when I asked him if he had been saved. And I didn't have a real good way of explaining it to him at that time. But it means to be saved from ourselves. Be saved from the sin that we've dug ourselves into. You see, nobody sins for you. You sin on your, on your own. You know, you don't have to teach a kid to sin. You don't have to teach a baby to sin. We have a, we have a new baby here that's a little over, almost two months old, two months old, and, and, and you know what? They're not going to have to teach him to do wrong. They're not going to have to teach him to tell them no. They're not going to have to teach him to act out. They're not going to have to teach him to scream to get what he wants. They're not going to have to teach him those things. They'll have to teach him not to do those things. But human nature, we all have that sin nature in us. And we, don't, we, look, at, we look at a newborn, we look at, at new, new babies and we, we think of how precious and sweet they are and how, how wonderful they are and they, 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 are, they, are, they are a precious gift of God. But they will grow up to be sinners. And we can't stop that. Every one of us. And that's why we needed a Savior. And we needed Him to say, seek us out and to take our sin that we have committed over however many years and to take those sins and wipe them clean. To forgive us of all of them. Erase them from, our, from our, our, our record. To take them away and say, you are no longer accountable to these. Because I saved you from them. And lastly, we needed the provision of a Savior. He had, a, he had a specific time that he was going to be born. You know, we, don't, we wonder today, we, we, keep, we keep thinking, when is Christ going to come? When is Christ going to come? It's, it's been 2,000 years. He said he was coming soon. You know, he'll come at the perfect time. Because when he came to Bethlehem, when he showed up as a baby, you know what? He came at the perfect time. Do you know that Israel was asking for over 2,000 years the same thing we're asking today? You know Noah was expecting the Messiah? Abraham was expecting the Messiah? Jacob was expecting the Messiah? David was expecting the Messiah. David was almost a thousand years before Jesus was born, but he was expecting to see the Messiah. So for it to have been 2,000 years since that time is nothing new. It's nothing special. But the thing is, is that God sent Jesus at the perfect time. He made a provision for him. He knew when the world needed that Savior to come. He also knew where matter of fact, he told us in Micah chapter 5 where he was going to be born. 
We knew that he was going to be born in the city of David. As the, shepherds, as, the, as the angels proclaimed to the shepherd, for unto you is born this day in the city of David. We were told that. that but, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. So he knew the time he knew the place and he provided for those. And then he, he provided the foundation for eternity. When he entered into humanity, he did it with a he did it with a heavy heart. We know that he had that heavy heart and we know that we know that he came as a baby and we don't think about the things, you know, we think about the, the, the fresh start and all that, but, but Jesus before he became that baby. He knew what the thirty three years that he walked on this earth was going to be like. He knew what the last day that he had on this earth was going to be like before he ever came. And the amazing thing is is he knew he knew that today that I was going to sin. He knew that throughout my life I was going to sin. He knew that throughout your life you were going to sin. He knew that, we was, that, that the world was going to make a mockery of him. And he chose to come anyway. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that just so amazing that... that all that he knew was going to come. John introduced him as the Lamb of God. The Magi recognized him as the King of the Jews. Thomas even called him my Lord and my God. And because of that, we get the opportunity. And we get the, the chance call him my savior he's not just savior of the world and we, you know we think of him as the savior of the world but but i like to i like to think of it a little more personal yeah i know that he came to save all of you and i know he came to save all the people throughout history that would call on his name but the best part is is that i get to say he is my savior When we think of Jesus and all that he did, I think about a story of a, we were talking this morning earlier about a one-room school, schoolhouse, what it was like. Back many years ago, back when they had one-room schoolhouses, there was this one town that was known for some really rough kids. And every school teacher that came along, they ended up running them off in about a week's time. This one young man came and he, he volunteered. He said he would teach. And they didn't think he'd last very long. But on his first day, he walked into the classroom and there was this one big old boy. They called him Big Tom. He was the roughest of all of them. And he said, all right, here's what I want to do. I want you as a class to make up the rules for the class. We're going to have class rules, but I want you to make them. And the kids, they started making their own class rules. And the first one was somebody said we should, <clears throat> we should have no, no stealing. He agreed. He wrote it down on the back blackboard. And one said, you know, nobody should be late. And he wrote that down. And, and they said no cussing. And he wrote that down. And they, they came up with ten new rules just for that classroom. And he said, okay, what's going to be the punishment for breaking one of these rules? And Big Tom, he, he says, well, they need to let, let, give them ten licks. That should be their, their punishment, it's ten licks. He said, well, that's pretty, pretty rough. And he said, they can all take it. If they can break these rules, they can take it. So they made their own rules, and 
Later that very day, Big Tom realized that his lunch was gone. He couldn't find his lunch. He told the teacher, somebody's took my lunch. Well, they got to question and got to look and they got to searching through everybody's desk. And there was this one little boy, 10-year-old, and he finally stood up and he said, I took his lunch. I was so hungry I couldn't help it. And the teacher said, well, you know the penalty. The class set the penalty. So you've got to take it. And the, the little boy, he said, you've got to take off that heavy coat. And the little boy said, please don't make me take off my coat. The teacher said, no, you've got to. It hangs down over your backside. You've got to take it off. And then he realized the boy didn't have a shirt on under his coat. And he said, well, I've, I've only got one shirt, and today was the day we watched it, so... I wear my older brother's coat on the day that I don't have, that my shirt's getting washed. And he said, my, my daddy's gone, he died. Mom, mom, she just she can't provide for us. And I didn't have anything to eat today. He said, well, the rules are the rules. And right before he reared back, Big Tom stood up. He said, I'll take his licks. I know he broke the rules and I know he took my lunch. But I'll take his licks. Tom took off his coat and went up and he, the teacher gave him his licks. Because it was the class rules that they had set. We all... God made a set of rules. And he said, there's punishment for those rules. If you break these rules, you don't, you don't get to go to heaven. But the thing is, I've said it before, God didn't change the law. Sacrifices still have to be made. Just like the law of the Old Testament, the lamb still has to be sacrificed. The thing is, is that Jesus stepped forward and he said, I will take his licks. I'll take his stripes. I'll be his sacrifice. You see, that's how he came to be my Savior. He knew I would break the rules. And just as I did... He stepped up to be my Savior. And in order for Him to be your Savior, you have to acknowledge Him. You have to say, Lord, I, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have done wrong, and I know that I, I know I don't deserve your heaven. I know I don't deserve your salvation. But if you'll save me, I'll give you my life. And I like to give everybody that opportunity. And we're not going to play any music right now. We're not going to have a, an invitation like we normally do. But I'm going to ask that before we take communion... We're told not to take communion unworthily. And before we take communion, I always like to give anybody an opportunity to confess to God. But I also like to give anybody an opportunity that don't know God to come to know Him. So I'm going to ask if everybody will just bow your heads for a moment. And if there's anybody here I don't normally do this. But if there's anybody here tonight that would, have, that would say, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. I know I'm a sinner, but I don't know Him as my Savior. If you say that tonight, would you just raise your hand for a moment? I'm not going to point you out.
if you don't know Him as your Savior, you have that opportunity. You always have that opportunity if He's drawing you, if He, if he calls on you, to say, Lord, I, I give you my life. And you can do that at any time. All you have to do is pray. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I repent of my sins. And I give you my life. And if you say that prayer in your heart, and you mean it, then you'll be a Christian. You'll, you will have Him in your heart. And listen, the great thing is, is He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. All right, if everybody could look this way. One of the names that we talked about, and as He came as our Savior, one of the things He told us, you see, hell is a place of eternal darkness. The world is a place of eternal darkness without Him. Darkness is actually just the absence of light. And He said, I am the light of the world. If you'll light your candle. If you have Jesus in your life, then we are the light of the world. He told us that. He said, you are the light of the world. Nobody lights a candle or a lamp and puts it under a bushel. Because of Him being our Savior, we have the opportunity to be the light of the world, to let our light shine. And tonight as we come and we look at we look at his sacrifice for us. We look at the way that he gave, that he saved us. The way that he did that was through sacrificing his body, his body broken, his flesh being torn, his blood being spilled. And here at Christmas, as we recognize him coming to the earth, we, we celebrate also his death. Because without the cross, the cradle would mean nothing. So as we come tonight for this time of, of communion, we need to remember that He is our Savior, and because of that, we light the world. There's three different accounts of the communion, or the Lord's Supper. And I like the account, and especially since we've been talking about the Christmas story in Luke. Luke chapter 22, it says, And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, With desire I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and break it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup. After supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. If our men will come. Glenn, would you bless them? Our Father, we come to you tonight. Just let everybody know what communion is all about. That you come to this world to save us. 
And when we take this bread, it's your body. The wine, it's your blood. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it he said this is my body take and eat <clears throat> Robert would you bless them Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time you get to come and just think about that sacrifice you made for us, Lord. We just thank you for that, Lord. We just thank you for the opportunity to get to come together tonight, Lord, to represent you in our life, Lord. We just ask you to go with us and strength. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.
And likewise, he took the cup after supper. said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which was shed for you. And I love Matthew's account, which says they sung a song and departed. And we normally sing Amazing Grace, but tonight we're going to sing 181, Joy to the World. 